Okay, welcome to CS4510, uh, F5-2. Uh, the topic of today's lecture is going to be on Turing machines. This is a new type of computer. We've given you, so far, I've given you what? I've given you uh, TFAs, I've given you NFAs, I've given you pushdown automata, I've given you context free grammars, I've given you regular grammars, I've given you all kinds of models. And we've shown equivalences or unequivalences between them. We've shown that some have higher power than others because they can decide languages that others can't. This, in a sense, is like the frontier of a computer. This is really, quote unquote, the last computer we'll talk about. And it's the most important one. Everything we've done was actually just fake. It was just a build up to this. This is like the whole point of the course. Uh, I'm going to devote an entire lecture on why the definition of a Turing machine is what it is. But for now, I'm just going to uh, define it, right? So you may already recognize some of these things. So to first is I guess as like a high level overview, we have some some crazy box or whatever, right? So you can imagine like the PDA. Right, so there was some way that we could look at the input, right? So we have some input. Right, we can read one way through the input, we can't read back. Now this is the part where I would draw the stack, but instead of a stack, what we have is called a tape. It is a one-way piece of paper, a one-way infinite piece of paper that just goes on forever. And uh, what we can do is like, read anywhere in the piece of paper. It's called a tape. You could think literally like a tape. Uh, we can read. So in one operation, what we do is we read from a cell. We can then move in the state diagram right to the cell and then choose to move the head on the tape left or right. Okay. So to formalize that, we have what? We have Q, uh, Sigma, Gamma, uh, delta, which is going to do all the work for us, uh, Q0, uh, QA, and QR. So what is this? This is the states. You might be familiar with most of this already. This is the input uh, alphabet. Elf. Alphabet. This is the tape. Alphabet. This is the transition function. It's going to take... Uh, state, it's going to read off the tape, and then it's going to move to a new state, it's going to write to the tape, and then it's going to move left or right. Q0 is the start state. A QR is the only accept state. And this is the only uh, reject state. So I should say here that these two are both in Q and that they are not the same. These two cannot be equal. All right. So this is the definition of a uh, Turing machine. You might immediately anal make the analogy that this is a pushdown automata, but I can then, I don't have to only read from the top of the stack. I can like peek through the tape, replace uh, a symbol, and then just keep going. This might also be analogous to your understanding of an actual computer because like a computer is not limited in the sense that the pushdown automata and the other things were. This is sort of like RAM, quote unquote. Uh, that's not very accurate to say uh, for what we'll do in the future because RAM is random access, right? So if I want to read the end of the tape or something, if there's like 100 digits... Uh, into the tape. I want to read it in random access machine. I could just read it. I just say give me the address send whatever at, a, at this address and it does But in a Turing machine, I, I have to, it takes time 100 it takes longer because I have to go move right a hundred times then read it Right, so technically it's not a RAM. There's something called a RAM machine which lets you do that. We'll talk about that maybe later So You can give a Turing machine like a state diagram and I encourage you to look at some examples of this but 
it's ugly, it's unreadable, it's, uh, and it doesn't even make any sense to you or anyone who might look at it. What's better is to give a high level uh, algorithm as you might actual code uh, and define that through the Turing machine states. So for example, um, consider uh, W uh, pound uh, W such that uh, W is a word in sigma start. So this was previously not a context-free language. So I'm giving you a language which we proved, you could prove via public, this is not a context-free language, uh, just so we can give you the first data point that a uh, Turing machine is not a, uh, is more powerful than a push down automata. Right, so basically what you're going to do is uh, write this input to the tape. You can assume the tape starts with all blanks. And in some models, it's easier just to assume that the input starts on the tape and that there is no input. Uh, the input starts on the tape. Let's suppose. If it doesn't, we just write it to the tape. Okay. Then we, then we, then we're there. Uh, then what we're going to do is just loop through the thing a billion times and then match the w and w. So we're going to say, uh, let's suppose that the input is on the tape to begin with, right? So, uh, so I'm going to say read uh, first. Uh, symbol and then you sort of keep that in uh, the states in the memory of the states right so you would have a q1 if you read a one or something right and then uh, I'm going to say like loop a write until after last a hash, right, or pound. Uh, then uh, if equal to, let's call this uh, x. If, yeah, if this equals x, if, the, uh, it's called, if this equals x, uh, then uh, write the pound. Then we say, uh, go back to beginning of 10. Go back to beginning. And then we can uh, mark uh, x with pound, right? And then re we repeat until we're, we're out, right? And then if, so, and then here, else uh, reject. Right, so there would be some digit where it doesn't match. So basically, what we're gonna have is we're gonna have like let's suppose zero ones pound uh, zero one. We're gonna see this symbol. We're gonna keep track of it. We're gonna loop until we get to this symbol. So we're gonna see the pound. Then we're gonna go one more, right? And then if these two equal, we're going to mark this one with the pound. So we're gonna erase it with the pound. Go back here, erase this with the pound, and then start over. Then we'll go back here. We'll see a one. Well, we're not going to mark it yet. We're going to then go to the end after the last pound symbol, mark it, then go back in a race and continue from there. And then we accept, except if tape only uh, contains pound. This is one algorithm on a Turing machine. It's kind of rough shot in, but it works. And there, there are others. You know, you could probably think of a. Uh, I'm not concerned right now with time, but you could probably think of maybe a better way to do this, instead of sort of zigzagging all over the place, right? I haven't really done a good job of describing the states, uh, the state of being of a Turing machine. But luckily, there is a notion we can use uh, that comes from us, and this is going to be very important later on. It's called a configuration. Uh, TM uh, configuration. So what we can do is write the entire state of being, quote unquote, of a Turing machine as a string. So suppose, so suppose that our Turing machine is at uh, this state. Let's call this QI, and then we 
are at a tape like this. And uh, this is the symbol we're reading. Let's call this uh, uh, A. Uh, we read symbol B. A is all, everything that comes before, and then C is everything that could come after, right? We can suppose we can describe this state. Uh, so this is everything about the Turing machine, by the way. This is the entire context of the tape. This is the current state we're at, and this is the current uh, part of the tape that the head is pointed to. Uh, we can uh, describe this state as a configuration, and the configuration is literally just a string. Um, it's going to be A, Q, I, B, C. So, as an example, if we were in, uh, let's say the tape looked like, uh, we were at some Q, let's say Q7 or something, and the tape looked like 00110, and we were pointing at this 1, we could write this then as 00Q7110, right? What's important here is, first of all, we have a very compact way of describing exactly the entire state of the Turing machine. What's on the tape? What's, uh, what state are we at? And there's also, maybe a not so obvious to you, an arith uh, arithmetic we can do here. We can sort of say, we can perform a sequence of these uh, configurations to determine if what the start and accept state could be, right? So... This could be an intermediate configuration, but the start configuration could look like, it should always look like Q0 and then X, if in X is the input to the machine, right? And then I'll give you another example of one. Let's suppose we were at, uh, I'll sort of expand this one. Let's say we were at state B. Uh, this is state C. No, I'll do it this way. Uh, we'll say A, B, and then the next one is C, and then this one is D, okay? Let's say we're pointed at state QI, and let's say we go we go to uh, QJ GJ, go to QJ and we move right. So what we're going to do is we're going to go like this, right? So what that's going to mean is we go from A QI B C D to A B. We're not reading or writing, but if we were, we could change B. Uh, B, Q, Q, J, C, D. And the word for this actually is yields. We say that this configuration yields this one if in the single Turing machine step, you can reach this configuration from this one. So this is just a quick introduction to uh, uh, Turing machines configurations, uh, I think. I'm going to give you several more examples of some languages which are, uh, which can be decided by on a uh, Turing machine. Okay, uh, there's another uh, example. Let's do, uh, powers of two are popular and I like unary languages. So let's, so let's do uh, zero to the two to the n such that uh, n is greater than or equal to zero, right? So what we're going to do here, the idea is we're just going to keep dividing the input by two, the length of the input by two, and then checking it each time if it possibly is odd. And then when we're left with one on the tape, then we just sort of uh, accept. And at any point, if we reach an odd number, then we knew the number was not a power of two. So we're, I'm going to write this as an algorithm. So we say uh, on... Uh, x, well, say so on uh, input, uh, let's call it w, uh, sweep uh, right, uh, mark, I'll say, uh, I'll say as we sweep right, if, I'll, I'll write this one a little more explicitly, if read one, if we read a one ever, uh, reject. Uh, if, uh, let's see, every other uh, cell 
uh, bright uh, pound. So now then we if uh, read a uh, blank uh, move left. So basically we're gonna like let's say something like this. What we're gonna do is we're gonna like go this way and then at the end of the tape, the tape is one way infinite, but the input is finite, right? So what's what's actually happening on the tape is that there's a, these blank symbols. So a lot of times what we 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 just say that gamma is equal to uh, this blank symbol, it's not a space, it's just called a blank. It's not a, like a space is in a, nothing, right? Uh, union, uh, the input alphabet. So this is what we describe gamma as usually. Then as soon as we hit the square, we're going to move back one. So, so we're at the last square, right? And then uh, if... Well, we finish sweeping. So like if uh, read pound... That means the input was even, right? Because we're doing every other one. So this one would be pound. This one would be pound. We move right. We see a blank. We move back left. If we read it was a pound, then what we do is we uh, delete it. So what? there's actually two things you can do here, right? You could say, well, I'm going to delete every pound sign and then compress the input. You could also just add a routine to skip uh, any pound sign that you may see. Right, but then have some some tailoring for the end here. Right, either way, uh, this is going to reduce the number of zeros by one. So what I what I another idea here is that the uh, you can build a Turing machine out of a lot of subroutines. Right, so you could build a, a subroutine for checking equality of strings. We did that previously. WW. You could use that then as a subroutine to build a bigger uh, Turing machine. He here I haven't described how to do it, but you could imagine you could build a uh, Turing machine, which would delete uh, symbols and then compress, right? So it would it would take input x pound uh, zero x pound, and it would output as an output as in what would be remaining on the tape after this computation would just be zero zero, right? So so if we read a pound, that means we knew it was even. So I'm just going to say delete all pounds and then compress, and then we repeat. Actually, let me add the else. Uh, else, I reject. Right. It, that means at some point we had an odd number. So then from here we repeat. So this is how you would do uh, zero to the n, zero to the two to the n. Right. You could imagine then, without having to actually describe it, that zero to the three to the n would would be uh, decidable by a Turing machine, uh, and so on. So far. I've talked about deciding languages, but I have to give a more fine-grained definition uh, when we talk about Turing machines. So, uh, definition, Turing, a decidable. Some places will call this uh, recursive, and this is an older, like, boomer notation. Uh, you may see this in some texts. It's not. It's nothing wrong with it. That's just the old name for it. I think the it'll make clear why this uh, this input why it's called decidable. So we say uh, a language L is uh, decidable if uh, for all x in L. Uh, t, uh, there exists a TM. Uh, I'll say it this way: it, as if uh, there exists a TM, let's call it M, such that uh, if X is an L, M accepts X. So this is really should be an if and only if, and if x is not in L, uh, m rejects uh, x. So this is sort of our classical definition of decidable. We can just call it decidable instead of Turing decidable, but it, it makes the context clear here that we're talking about deciding on a Turing machine. This is a slightly different definition of Turing uh, recognition 
Uh, so this is sometimes called recursively innumerable. Um, and we, and it's a very similar definition, but we relax the constraints. A language L is uh, Turing uh, recognizable if uh, there exists a TM M uh, such that if X is an L M accepts X uh, if X is not in L M may reject X or it may loop uh, forever. By loop here, you know, you can imagine that the machine gets stuck in some infinite loop, similar to how you have a programming language stuck in an infinite loop, where you say, okay, I read left, uh, I write one, I move right, I write one, I move left, I write one, I move right, I, live, I write one. This machine will never halt, right? By halt, I mean, you know, it comes to a stop. A DFA always halts. In fact, it takes exactly as number the number of steps in the length of the input. Similar for a grammar, right? Uh, for for a string of length n, which proved Chomsky normal form, it needs two to the n minus one steps. Exactly two to the n minus one steps. But it's not necessarily true that Turing machines must halt. So this is where we come up with this sort of two definitions, where a, uh, we have a recognizable, which is a weaker definition, and a decidable. Now, from this constraint, it should be obvious to you that I'm going to say uh, the decidable languages are a subset of uh, the recognizable languages. Right. Is it a strict subset? Is it an equality? Those are some great questions, and we will get to them uh, much later on. Okay. So... Just to give you some more some examples of decidable languages, by the same argument that a DFA uh, is also a PDA without a stack, a DFA is also a Turing machine uh, without a tape. The Turing machine may just not use the tape, and then it recognizes uh, any regular language, right? So uh, the regular languages are all... Uh, Decidable. Uh, similarly, if you use the tape, you can simulate a PDA on a Turing machine. Why? If you can imagine yourself having that operation of uh, simulating the stack on the tape where you only read from the beginning and then you do the popping off and the shifting and all that, right? So the context free languages are also a subset of decidable languages. And uh, I've given you examples. Uh, I gave you 0 to the 2 to the n as in one example of a language, uh, which is not context-free and then certainly not regular. So these are strict subsets, actually. Our picture of the world is then we have like regular languages, we have context-free languages, we have uh, decidable languages, and we have recognizable languages, which I won't draw because I haven't discussed if it's a strict subset or not. But... So right now we have a, a sort of hierarchy. What's interesting about the Turing machines is not just uh, as an acceptance problem. Like w the DFA accepts and the push down automata has to accept or reject. And But a Turing machine can just, quote unquote, it can just compute. It doesn't have to like take an input and then just start it doesn't have to take the input and say yes or no. It can just, you know, do things. For example, I could make a Turing machine to add two numbers. Uh, and we would consider that as the language problem, you know, like, if a, if a machine could understand this language, let's say A to the I, uh, B to the J, uh, C to the I uh, plus J, we could say, okay, well, maybe this machine understands addition, right? 
But instead of just determining acceptance, by the way, this is context free, right? Uh, but it, instead of determining acceptance, it could literally be like a calculator. You could imagine that it actually just takes any two integers as input and will output uh, the sum. And by output, I mean it halts with that left on the tape. I could make a Turing machine to like flip. So I'm going to give you some more examples and try and do them more statefully. Uh, so you at least understand the state diagram idea of a Turing machine, even if it's not that practical, right? So here's things a Turing machine can do that other things can't. Number one, nothing. A Turing machine can do nothing. Um, that's kind of more powerful than it seems. Sometimes doing nothing is doing something. Uh, and I really prefer to do nothing a lot of times. It's an active choice, you know. A DFA can't do nothing. At each step, a DFA must read from the input. It has to. Uh, so the fact that the Turing machine can just, like, do nothing is kind of cool. What do I mean by that? Well, what we do is we just run through time, uh, but our configuration stays the same. So we're at some state. Um, let's start like this. Let's say we read some input X uh, from the tape, and then I'm going to write back that same input X. I'm not changing it. And then I move right. I uh, read whatever input was I'm uh, from the tape. I write back that same input again, and then I move left. So what I've done here is I've moved through the states. Technically, I could have made these. Uh, I could have made this state and this state the same, but I moved through the states without moving the, without changing the tape at all. Right. So as a as a preview, what's going on here? I have, let's say if A B C, I'm at here, and I uh, I read A. I write A and I move to B. I read B, I write B, and I move back to A. All right? Tape doesn't change. If I were to draw this as a configuration, by the way, let's suppose, you know, there's some who knows going on this way and that way. So let's say I start a Q, uh, let's call this Q1, uh, Q2, and Q3, just for fun. I'm at Q1, and I see A, a B, C. Then from that, I can yield. So I read A, I write A, and I move right. That yields me uh, A, Q, 2, B, C. Uh, I read B, I write B, and I move left. So that is going to yield me Q, 3, A, B, C. So this is what the configuration of the Turing machine might, might look like. Here's something else a Turing machine could do. Uh, scan. Uh, I'll just say, uh, for without loss of generality, it can scan right. So what that means is uh, what we do, we're going to do is we're going to just basically loop through the input, loop through the tape, and uh, we have a condition where we can leave the tape if we see something funny. So I'm going to uh, read a zero. I'm going to write that zero back, and I'm going to move right. If I see a one... I'm going to write that one. Let me not put these commas. If I read a zero, I'm going to move, uh, write a zero and move right. If I see a one, I'm going to write a one and I'm going to move right. Then I could have some uh, branching condition here. Let's say I did something like this. And let's say if I read a blank, I write a blank and I move left. And then I accept. All right. So what this is going to do is it's just going to move uh, through the tape. And that's it. And then I could have some other branching condition if I see a certain symbol, right? Um, I could do something like uh, flip bits. So what that transition is going to look like is... If I see a I see a one, I'm gonna write the zero, and I'm gonna move right. If I see the one, uh, zero, I'm gonna write a one. I'm gonna move uh, right. Now I could compose these, right? I could say, well, I'm going to scan right, and while I'm scanning, I'm going to flip bits. 
right? So here's a Turing, here's a here's a here's a a solid state diagram of a Turing machine. So I'm gonna first I'll say compose two and three. What does that get me? I'm going to uh If I see a 1, I'm going to write a 0 and move right. If I see a 0, I'm going to write a 1 and move uh, right. And then if I see my blank, which means I'm at the end of the input on the tape, uh, I'm going to write that blank back and move left 1, and then I'm going to accept. So let's consider uh, the bit flipping. Let's call this Q0, and let's call this QA, right? Because that's the accept state. And this is the start state, obviously. I'm going to say... Uh, let's suppose our configuration starts with Q0101. So we start with 101 on the tape. What the Turing machine is going to do is it's going to read through the input. It's going to flip the bit. It's going to take the complement, and then it's going to halt. So uh, Q0101, uh, that's going to yield. Well, I'm going to read 1, write 0, and move right. So it's going to yield 0Q001. That is going to, I'm going to read a 0, write a 1, and move right. So that's going to yield 1, 0, uh, excuse me, uh, 0, 1, Q, 0, 0. No, 1. I see a 1. I'm at Q, 0. I write a 0, and I move right. That's going to give me 0, 1, 0, Q, uh, 0. And then there's, a, in, there's infinitely many blanks. Uh, pass the input. Uh, so I read this blank. I am at Q0. I have to take this branch. So I write back a blank and then I move left on the tape. So I'm going to be Q, uh, so it's going to be 0, 1, uh, 0, Q, A, uh, blank. So I didn't have to move left really. It doesn't matter. But I'm, I'm just ending on the last character uh, for fun. So I flipped the input. Right. This is sort of an example of a machine which we, we're not talking about language uh, uh, set containment, but ra ra rather actual computation. Uh, Turing, in his original paper, he gave some examples of Turing machines, things that would start with no input and uh, then produce digits of pi or e. Right? You could imagine you could write a program which, using some trig trigonometry, you could produce digits of pi. Or maybe the square root of a number, right? You approximate it through a Turing machine. It would have, might have who knows how many states, but I believe that you could do it. Okay, I'm going to give you just one more definition uh, for this introduction to Turing machines. And then the next lecture, I'm going to expand on it in incredible depth. If you're thinking I'm being fast and loose here with the formality, uh, you're right. But it'll make sense why I'm doing that uh, shortly. So we say... A function uh, from sigma star to sigma star, let's call it f, is computable if there exists a tm m such that m uh, starts with w on its tape and halts with uh, f of w so when i talk about computable functions when i say the word computable functions you can think i'm talking about the set of decidable languages there's this, co this correspondence between the machines uh that can compute that can describe computable functions and the languages which are decidable.